Hi everyone, it's Katrina, cult of a warrior god. In March of this year, 2020, archaeologists discovered a never-before-seen cult location in the archaeological site of Girzu in modern-day Iraq. This area dates back to around 5,000 years ago and was dedicated to the worship of Ningirsu, who was a prominently worshipped warrior god for Mesopotamians. Apparently, this site had been used to make sacrifices and hold religious ceremonies, and possibly even more. While excavating this location in particular, archaeologists unearthed over 300 various ancient artifacts in Girsu. Among them were various ceramic cups and jars, as well as vessels which housed a bunch of animal bones, likely for religious purposes. In the middle of these artifacts was a favisa, or a pit for ritualistic ceremonies that was over 8 feet deep. These cups were most likely used during a religious feast before being thrown into the pit as some sort of ritual. One of the most amazing things they found was a bronze figurine shaped like a duck with eyes made out of shell. Cuneiform tablets found at the site in the late 19th century describe the feasting and processions that went on there. They lasted for around four days and happened twice a year to get into Ningirsu's good graces. Ningirsu was a god heavily associated with agriculture and war and possibly healing. Following his path was supposed to lead to cure from illness, and was also supposed to imbue the worshipper with demonic powers. Eventually, he became a beacon of war and was worshipped as the ideal warrior. 60 Mammoths Back in the day, humans had to be pretty inventive with their hunting techniques. They were up against way bigger animals with much more limited technology. It was more of a fair fight back then. Or was it? When archaeologists uncovered some pits that were around 15,000 years old containing a dozen sets of mammoth bones, they thought that ancient humans might have designed these pits as a sort of mammoth trap. But recently, archaeologists found another set of pits only 6 miles away from the original, and it contains the bones of around 60 mammoths. All of these pits are right around Mexico City, and the new site is divided between three different pits. Also, they're located on what would have been the shore of Chaltocan, a lake that used to be in the area. Because of the mud, archaeologists think that it might have been easy for mammoths to get stuck in the muck. But it would be hard to resist all of the wonderful foliage that the shoreline had to offer, which means that humans had a chance to attack. Strangely enough, however, archaeologists haven't seen any signs that the 60 mammoths in these new pits were slaughtered by humans. But there isn't enough evidence to rule out the hypothesis that they might have used them after their muddy death. All of these factors point to an amazing amount of human ingenuity. Could ancient humans have known to lure them into the muck? Could mammoths have been a major part of our diet? There's more to learn and we'll definitely keep looking. 300,000 year old elephant. Archaeologists have also just announced that they discovered the skeletal remains of a straight tusked elephant from over 300,000 years ago. It was discovered at an archaeological site in Schoningen, which is in Lower Saxony, Germany, the same area where archaeologists discovered a group of throwing spears in the 1990s, as well as the bones of saber-toothed cats. Because of these discoveries, this archaeological site has become an important source for knowledge about the Pleistocene era. What are straight-tusked elephants? Well, the name pretty much describes the creature. They were an ancient form of elephant whose tusks were not curved like our contemporary variant, but rather jutted straight out from their heads. And they were pretty huge. For instance, from the skeleton that they retrieved from the Schoningen site in Germany, the tusks were about seven and a half feet long. But they were also about to uncover a lot more remnants from this creature, including part of its jaw, some of its spine, and leg bones. From these, they were able to determine that the elephant they uncovered was a female who was over 9 feet tall and probably weighed somewhere around 6.8 tons. This makes it a bit bigger than the contemporary African elephant cow, which is no small feat. Thankfully, they were also able to determine that this elephant probably died of old age, but others got to it after. There were also remains of bite marks on her bones, and there were flint flakes near the body, indicating that her bones had been marked with tools, so humans got to her as well. 1.5 millionth archaeological object Archaeologists devote their entire lives to locating and investigating ancient artifacts, but occasionally your everyday citizen just stumbles upon one by accident in their backyard. You might think that this doesn't happen all that often, but as it turns out, the British Museum's Portable Antiquities Scheme announced that they'd received the 1.5 millionth tiny artifact discovered by an average citizen, a tiny token from Pope Innocent IV. 
Sure, sometimes people find ancient artifacts, but the 1.5 millionth, and that's in the England Wales area alone? I need to be on the lookout for artifacts more often. What's more, this artifact has a pretty interesting story. This token was a papal bulla, which was a kind of seal that the Pope would use to authorize official documents from the church. It's a cool item to push the portable antiquities scheme past the 1.5 million yard line. This discovery occurred on July 8th, so we're probably well beyond this yard line now. Many people had to stop their amateur metal detecting activities during the English coronavirus lockdown. But now that many of the restrictions have been lifted, the PAS is back to recording more and more discoveries. In honor of the 1.5 millionth artifact, the British Museum posted a list of the 10 most important discoveries that have come their way. You can check it out for yourself on their website. Human Presence in Early Americas Stone tools discovered in a cave in Mexico suggest that humans inhabited North America much earlier than we previously thought. While stone tools may not necessarily make headlines, archaeologists have reason to think that these tools date back to around 26,500 years ago, which places the time period where humans began to inhabit the American continent much earlier than most scientists believe. Of course, any time that a discovery this controversial shows up, it must be met with skepticism, but it might just be legit. Academics are constantly debating exactly when humans showed up in the Americas. It's quite hard to establish a dead-set timeline, although they do think that they traveled from Asia. But most archaeologists place the time period when humans arrived from between 15,000 to 17,000 years ago. But how else could the tools that they found in Zacatecas, a state in Mexico, date back to 26,500 years ago if humans weren't around by then? Plus, there's some reason to believe that they were made as far as 30,000 years ago. Unfortunately, the researchers weren't able to find any traces of human DNA, so this makes it harder to verify the discovery beyond the dating techniques. But there have been other discoveries which seem to place humans in the Americas before the accepted dates. There were a few sites in Brazil where archaeologists thought that some of the artifacts they found might be over 20,000 years old. It's getting harder to ignore the facts. Everything is getting older, including us. En Esur Just north of Tel Aviv and Israel, there is a city that's been lost for generations. Archaeologists believe that it was so big that it might have even been the New York City of its era. Could you even imagine that it would be possible for a city this important to go unnoticed for millennia? But that's precisely what archaeologists think is the case with respect to their excavations at the archaeological site of En Esur, which was recently excavated to pave the way for a new road through the area. However, what they found there was way more important than a new highway. This was one of the biggest undiscovered ancient cities in all of Israel, even though it's estimated to be around 5,000 years old. Bordered by a fort-like wall, this city was well-designed and clearly important during its time period. There was evidence of urban planning, such as streets and places to live, all which indicate that En Esur was way ahead of its time in terms of social structure and development. Thousands of people lived in the area in the early Bronze Age, where they organized their lives around agriculture. They probably traded with other settlements nearby as well. There is even some evidence to suggest that there are structures from over 7,000 years ago below those houses that are already 5,000 years old. Researchers are sure to keep striking gold. They've already found tons of pottery, tools, and a big temple. Stay tuned for more info about this place, because Enesur is definitely going to be big. Woodhenge Recently, archaeologists working within the Pertigoes archaeological complex in Portugal uncovered a striking structure that's a kind of woodhenge. Originally, the land in the archaeological site was going to be made into a vineyard, but then the discoveries started coming in. Researchers found that much of the complex had been constructed at some point between 3,500 and 2,000 BC. Naturally, they decided that this warranted study and preservation. And let's thank them for continuing to look at the site because this discovery is pretty wild. This is a gigantic construction that's made out of wood. It's almost 60 feet wide, in fact. They've determined that it probably had some sort of ritualistic significance. There have been other constructions like this located throughout Europe that have been termed woodhenges due to their similarity to the famous Stonehenge. This woodhenge is located at the center of a large network of ditches, and that seems to amplify its ceremonial significance. 
There are only a few ways to get inside the structure, and one of them points in the direction of the summer solstice, which again reinforces the idea that it had a religious purpose. This is also popular with the other wood henges that have been discovered. It seems that these places aligned closely with the kinds of beliefs that their creators held. This will undoubtedly continue to be a site of further research. Crystal Weapons Crystals are associated with aristocracy and royalty, and few have gone so far as to use them as weapons. But archaeologists in Valencina de la Concepción, Spain, recently uncovered a remarkable discovery. Alongside the normal fruits of their excavation efforts, they found a bunch of crystals made from quartz that had been shaped into usable weapons. Of particular interest is this crystal dagger, although there were a total of 10 arrowheads and 4 blades made from quartz found on the site. The name of the archaeological site where they found these weapons is the Monte Lirio Tholos, and researchers were digging through what it had to offer between 2007 and 2010. It was a giant megalithic creation, and the big stones that made it up extended over 120 feet long. Apparently the site was a popular place for finding metals underneath the earth, and that's why there were so many crystal weapons to be found there. Strangely enough, however, the weapons found on site were clearly not made from the crystals that were located there. Researchers have identified a couple of places where they might be able to locate the original crystal deposit, but they're just not sure which one is correct. These crystal daggers do indicate that the people inhabiting this site probably had a rich weapon crafting tradition. There were also around 20 sets of bones found in the area, but no one knows if these weapons belong to them. They were buried separately. Maybe they had a religious significance? We'll just have to wait to find out. A lot of patience is required when it comes to discoveries. Tomb of the Silver Dragons Just recently, a number of archaeologists working in Mongolia unearthed two incredible ornate tombs that were constructed to serve as the final resting place of some of the nobility within the nomadic Qiongnu Empire. Although not discussed as often as the Chinese Empire, they were around the same regions at the same time. In particular, the Qiongnu Empire maintained control of the eastern part of the so-called Eurasian steppes from the 3rd century well into the 1st century AD. Naturally, since both the Qiongnu and the Chinese's Han Dynasty were fighting for control of similar regions, they were often at each other's throats. They were pretty much in constant war with one another. The Qiongnu became such a problem for the Han Dynasty that they built a big wall to fortify themselves. In effect, this became a part of the Great Wall of China. Many parts of China's Great Wall came into being in a similar way, in an effort to fend off enemies or at least intimidate them. The tombs that these Mongolian archaeologists uncovered were filled to the brim with extraordinary goodies. In one tomb, they found a number of boxes that each housed fine silver jewelry, belt accessories made from jade, and some incredibly detailed dragon figurines that were gilded with silver. In the other tomb, they also found equestrian ornaments that each depict some kind of unicorn deity. This discovery is sure to give researchers further insight into the Qiongnu Empire. Scarabray on the coast of the Orkney Islands of Scotland, there is a village called Scarabray that was first inhabited sometime around 5,000 years ago. That means that it's older than both Stonehenge and the Great Pyramids of Egypt. And even though it's not talked about as much as either of those two sites, that's not because it's any less interesting. In fact, in terms of preservations, it's one of the best settlements we have from the Neolithic era in European history. Almost everything in Scarabray is still standing. The village consists of a number of homes made from stone that are still there to be explored. There are even a number of beds made from stone, although you'd have to imagine that they wouldn't have been too comfortable. Scarabray also features Scotland's oldest toilet. Clearly, the settlement had a lot going for it, especially compared to some of the similar sites that date to around that same time period. So who lived in Scarabray? It is believed it was a group of farmers and hunters whose combined efforts enabled them all to stay in one place for a long time. However, for some reason that no one quite understands, everyone left Scarabray in about 2500 BC. What caused everyone to up and leave without any warning? There aren't any bones there, nor are there signs that there were any wars going on, so the end remains a mystery. Cliff Palace If you're ever in the area, you should definitely check out Cliff Palace, which is nestled inside of the Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado. It's well-named. It's pretty much an entire city that's been built into the side of a mountain. 
It was the largest cliff dwelling in North America in the 1200s, built by the ancestral Puebloans, also known as the Anasazi, a group of people native to the Four Corners region of the U.S., where the states of Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona connect. There were over 150 rooms inside of Cliff Palace, built using sandstone, mortar, and wooden beams. Families lived together and used ladders to get up and down the cliffs. There are nearly 600 cliff dwellings like this that remain, most with a kiva, a special round room used for ceremonies and rituals. Some of the dwellings date back almost 1,000 years old, and no one knows why the Puebloans moved into the canyons, but perhaps in this position they were more secure and closer to water. These larger cliff houses are like ancient apartment buildings preserved by the cliffs. Around 1300 AD, everyone left, although no one really knows why. Perhaps a combination of factors such as the growing population, drought, and overhunting forced them to migrate. The site was lost for 700 years, but the story goes that some cowboys looking for some lost cattle found it and word got out. Explorers raided the site and left everything bare. The structures have also been exposed to the elements. Luckily, it is now protected by the government and you can go explore it for yourself. Have you ever been here or do you want to go? Let me know in the comments below. Apples. Who would have thought archaeologists would study fruit? You might think that apples have been around for as long as we have, but the history of apples is actually a long and winding journey between continents. Robert Spengler, an archaeobotanist, which is pretty much an archaeologist but with respect to botanical matters, recently completed a survey which covered a boatload of archaeological and historical info, in which he argues that ancient humans had an even more interesting relationship with apples than we might have previously thought. He thinks that when humans first discovered apples, they ended up spreading apple seeds around the world. In this way, they were acting a lot like the mastodons of antiquity would have behaved around apples. They were also thought to be attracted to apples and are in large part responsible for the dispersal of apple trees around the world. Apples aren't too good at growing on their own. One bad apple can ruin the bunch. So they need animals like humans and mastodons to carry them around the world. Additionally, scientists have been able to trace the existence of apples back to one region on the planet. Almaty, a city in Kazakhstan. And Almaty wears its apple badge proudly. There's even an apple fountain in the middle of town. Now you can find the last wild apple trees in the Tian Shan Mountains in Kazakhstan. They serve as a testament to the strangely storied history that apples have experienced over the years. Etruscan Boar Helmet In 1964, a group of curators at the Harvard Art Museum came upon a piece that they'd had in their collection for quite some time, even though they don't know how it got there. Take a look at this strange piece. What does it look like to you? Some experts have identified this as a helmet that's been made to look like the head of a wolf, although the art museum's website claims that it's a boar's head. Whatever it is, it's clearly been through a lot. Experts estimate that this helmet comes from sometime during the 5th or 6th century BC and has its origins in the Etruscan civilization. Given that it comes from the Etruscans, it makes sense that it would be a boar's head. Their art often included depictions of boars. But knowing its period and location of origin doesn't take away from the enigmatic nature of this piece. What was it used for? Why did it pass so long through the generations? And how did it end up in the museum? The website states that the helmet likely had some sort of ritualistic purpose. It appears to have been repaired many times over the course of its history, even into the modern era. The only things that we have to compare it to are the depictions of boar's heads that were often fashioned onto Etruscan chariots, as no other helmets like this have been found in good condition. It could be the case that many of the features of this helmet could have been fashioned from pieces that were originally fastened onto the chariots, but it must have been very impressive to behold. Medieval Female Scribe A team of researchers wanted to look at plaque on the teeth of ancient skeletons. Not my personal preference, but what they found was actually pretty incredible and surprising. As they looked at the chemical composition of a woman buried in the 11th or 12th century in Germany from a religious community, they realized that her teeth had blue plaque. But what was it? After a very long investigation involving physicists, historians, archaeologists, and a micro-ramen spectroscopy revealed that the plaque was lapis lazuli, a very rare stone mined from a single mine in what is now Afghanistan during medieval times. It was ground up to make ultramarine, a pigment used in painting medieval manuscripts. It was more valuable than gold. So the question now was, how did it get into her mouth? Christina Warriner, a molecular archaeologist at Harvard University and the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History, said, We wondered how on earth a woman at this early date, in a kind of backwater location, came into contact with this incredibly expensive mineral. She was most likely a scribe, whose job it was to produce fine manuscripts. 
For a long time, contemporary historians have thought that women didn't play much of a role in medieval bookmaking, but this adds to a lump of evidence that's upending that preconception. It appears that women simply didn't sign their names on their work out of humility. Warriner said that we do have a few surviving manuscripts written by women around the same time period, and they have been using handwriting recognition to uncover other works. Who knows how many other female artists and authors might be out there, just waiting for scientists to look at their teeth. Angkor Angkor is an archaeological site in northern Cambodia with a rich history behind it. It is one of the most important archaeological sites in Southeast Asia, stretching over 154 square miles and is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It was home to two religions, Hinduism and Buddhism, and is considered the largest religious monument on Earth. Angkor is famous for being the capital of the Khmer Empire between the 9th and 15th centuries AD. This is arguably the most illustrious period in the entire history of Cambodia. However, eventually the power of the Khmer Kingdom waned, and by 1431, armies from Ayutthaya captured Angkor, and many of the people living there left. In the 12th century, King Suryavaraman II of the Khmer Empire began construction on an enormous temple complex. The rock came from quarries nearby, but scientists have long wondered how the bricks used to build Angkor Wat were brought to the site. Five million tons of sandstone blocks were used to build the city, and it looks like the mystery may have finally been solved. Ancient builders used a network of canals connecting the quarries to the temple so they could float the rocks down on rafts, making everything much easier. Angkor Wat was built as a symbolic representation of Mount Meru, which in Hindu mythology is the sacred mountain standing at the center of the universe. Over time, the ancient city was reclaimed by nature, and it was rediscovered in the 1840s. Situated in the middle of the jungle, the vast array of trees and vines began to take over the once illustrious city. Now the temple area has been taken over by the forest, although we still aren't sure why everyone left. Some have suggested that it was not only warfare, but a quickly changing climate that brought Angkor to its knees. More recently, laser scans have revealed a whole network of ancient cities in Cambodia. Thanks to LIDAR, we now have a new understanding of what the Khmer Empire looked like at the apex of its power, as well as newly discovered lost cities hidden by the jungle. Mass Sacrifice in Peru In 2019, a group of Peruvian archaeologists excavating in Pampa La Cruz, Peru, uncovered the skeletal remains of 227 children who had been sacrificed. Of the bodies they discovered, they estimated that the children's ages varied between 5 and 14 years old. Although this isn't the first collection of child sacrifices discovered, it's definitely the largest. Archaeologists believe this was part of three mass sacrificial events interpreted as offerings by the Chimu people in response to El Niño events around 1250 AD. In addition to the children's remains, they found nearly 400 llamas, and archaeologists don't think they're done either. They're expecting to find more remains as they continue the excavation process. At the very least, they know that these sacrifices belong to the Chimu civilization, who inhabited northern Peru between 1200 to 1400 AD. At the time, they held immense power over the region, until the Incas took over. The Chimu worshipped Xi, who was a god representative of the moon. They felt that the moon was more important than the sun, spiritually speaking, since it was around both during the night and during the daytime. They also seemed to know that it helped control the tides and believed it affected coastal weather. Archaeologist Gabriel Prieto of the University of Florida believes the earliest Pampa La Cruz sacrifice may have had a political purpose. He says that it's intriguing that this first sacrificial event occurred at exactly the same time the Chimu were conquering people such as the Lambayeque, who lived in the valleys to the north. It's fascinating to imagine that the victims may have been Lambayeque citizens brought here to celebrate those victories. According to archaeology.org, another possible interpretation is that the sacrifice was meant to honor Taikanamo, the legendary founder of the Chimu, who is said to have come from the sea and walked south to found the Chimu capital of Chan Chan around 1000 AD. Pampa La Cruz overlooks the exact spot where he is thought to have landed. Sroda Treasure The Sroda Treasure is one of the flashiest treasure troves ever discovered. Workers were just going about their business trying to tear down a building in Sroda a town in Poland, when they discovered a relatively unassuming vase, which actually contained over 3,000 precious coins. 
Naturally, these workers kept an eye out for more. Demolitions of another building close by revealed more gold and silver coins. Then people really started looking. Locals started searching the landfill where the construction workers had taken the debris from the buildings. And that's when things got really exciting. The demolished buildings were home to a whole collection of treasure. In addition to all the coins, people discovered a number of pieces of ornate jewelry dating back to as early as the 12th century AD. Among them was a complete golden crown, which which researchers believe belonged to the first wife of Emperor Charles IV, four 12th and 13th century gold pendants, a medieval gold clasp containing precious stones, and a sapphire ring. With all of these finds, experts have determined that the treasure belonged to Charles IV, who had probably sold or pawned it to raise funds to support his claim to be the king of the Romans. It is very surprising that these treasures weren't melted down or destroyed. You can now see these jewels in the National Museum of Wrocław, Poland. This collection is estimated to be worth over $120 million. Caesarea Sunken Treasure In 2015, a pair of Israeli divers were scuba diving near the shores of Caesarea, a port town famous in ancient times, off the coast of Israel in the Mediterranean. The area is now home to Caesarea National Park. From afar, one of the divers spotted a candy wrapper glittering on the ocean floor. He got closer to pick it up when he realized that what he thought was a piece of plastic was actually a gold coin. Then he found another, and another. The whole floor was littered with them. They had found the treasure from a shipwreck. A merchant ship had sunk some 1,600 years ago, and the divers immediately reported their findings to the Israel Antiquities Authority, which is required by law. A group of experts from the IAA showed up and scoured the area further, discovering some bronze artifacts and nearly 2,000 gold coins. Because they'd been so well preserved in the Mediterranean Sea, researchers were able to determine that they were probably somewhere around 1,000 years old. Most were dinars made from 24 karat gold, minted and used when Caesarea was part of the Islamic Fatimid dynasty. It has been hard to determine how much this hoard is worth exactly, but taking into account its location and the history of the coins, it has been considered priceless. The divers were given an award, and archaeologists are excited to see what else divers will discover. St. Albans Hoard In 2012, Wesley Carrington decided to buy his first metal detector. He was searching a field around St. Albans, Hertfordshire, a small area in England, when he found a ginormous hoard of Roman-era coinage. Call it beginner's luck. But the coins he found ended up making up one of the biggest hoards of gold Roman coins buried in the UK. There were a total of 159 Roman solidi, which is a very pure kind of gold coin from the late years of the Roman Empire, and archaeologists have dated them back to the 4th century AD, when the Romans stopped occupying Britain. This type of coin was very valuable and not traded or exchanged on a regular basis. They were in wonderful condition, and it looks like they were buried for safekeeping. However, nobody came back for them. One curator from the museum explained that sometimes coins were buried for safety, but also most coin burials at the time had religious intentions. One might take their wealth and bury it in tribute to the gods. Now you can go see this collection at the Verulamium Museum. That's in part because St. Albans, which was once known as Verulamium, was a very important town during the time of the Roman Empire. Saddle Ridge Hoard The Saddle Ridge Hoard is a treasure trove of coins estimated to be worth over $10 million. But to this day, no one is quite sure where this treasure came from. A couple living in Northern California discovered the so-called Saddle Ridge Hoard by accident while they were out on a stroll around their sizable property with their dog. Then they saw an old can, and when they took it out of the ground, they found it to be filled with coins. They returned to the site of the can and found even more. In total, they dug up around eight cans that were stuffed to the brim with coins after finding them with a metal detector, a whopping 1,427 coins in total, all gold. Afterwards, they contacted the coinage authorities and discovered that these coins were in mint condition. This was the largest discovery of lost treasure in U.S. history. It seems like the coins were buried on the property sometime in the late 19th century. Most of the coins are $20 gold pieces dating after 1854 during the gold rush. At face value, they are worth about $28,000, but now they are worth millions. Many people think that someone robbed the U.S. Mint since they were in such pristine condition, but the government has denied this theory. They might just be the life savings of someone who didn't trust the banks to keep their savings safe. Any theories? Tell me in the comments below. Queerdale Hoard The Queerdale Hoard consists of over 8,600 precious artifacts dating back to the Viking era. That makes it one of the biggest hoards of Viking treasure ever discovered. 
What's more, this hoard of treasure, like most others, was found completely by accident. In 1840, some laborers were working on the River Ribble in a town called Queredale, which is close to Preston, England. When they were digging, they hit a big chest made of lead, and what they found inside was pretty amazing. In the chest were thousands of artifacts from an era long gone. There were over 7,000 coins from different parts of Europe and the Middle East. The heaviest part of the hoard was the bullion, weighing over 80 pounds. Some had been melted into ingots, and there was also a lot of silver jewelry, including brooches, rings, more rings, bracelets, necklaces, beads, a silver comb, all kinds of ancient luxury items. This treasure is believed to have been buried sometime between the years 905 and 910 AD, soon after the Vikings were forced to leave Dublin. It was probably some type of war chest, trying to raise funds to try to get Dublin back. When it was found, the treasure was given to Queen Victoria, and now you can see the majority of it at the British Museum. Have you ever had a chance to see the Queredale Hoard? Let me know in the comments below! Bactrian Gold In 1978, just one year before the Soviets took over Afghanistan, a joint Soviet-Afghan archaeological team uncovered one of the most splendorous finds in history, the discovery of some 20,600 artifacts dating from the 1st century BC through the 1st century AD. It was found at the site known as Tilyatepe, which is Persian for Golden Hill, which is pretty accurate based on the discovery. The trove itself is now known as the Bactrian Gold. This find gives us a rare look at the ancient culture that once inhabited Afghanistan. Archaeologist Viktor Saryandi and his team found six burial chambers at the site full of the golden treasures, such as a crown, a solid gold belt, necklaces set with semi-precious stones, medallions, and many other jewels. Researchers think that the trove belonged to members of the Juezi royal dynasty, buried around 2,000 years ago. This treasure trove went missing during the chaos that befell the region after several occupations. Somehow, it made it out alive and was brought back into the public eye in 2003. Grauville Hoard When Reg Mead and Richard Miles heard tell of some coins on a farmer's property in Grauville on the English Channel's island of Jersey in 1980, they couldn't wait to check it out. They got out their metal detectors and asked for permission from the landowner to investigate. He obliged. It took 30 years of searching, but eventually these determined detectorists found what they'd been looking for, around 70,000 coins from both the Roman era and the Iron Age. Experts came in to help dig them out, revealing one of the largest Celtic hordes in the world. The coins themselves were nestled inside of the clay underground, and when all was said and done, they weighed around 1,650 pounds in total. Archaeologists have dated the coins to somewhere around 30 to 50 BC, and they also think that it belonged to a Celtic tribe known as the Coriosolite. This tribe was probably fleeing from the Romans at the time, and they needed a place to keep their stash, so they buried it. Along with all of the coins, there are a number of other interesting artifacts. For example, there are gold and silver pieces of jewelry and a leather purse. All of this is making me think that I should get a metal detector. Frome Hoard The Frome Hoard was voted the top treasure of the UK when it was discovered. Although it isn't worth the most money at face value, about $421,000, the Frome Hoard remains one of the most remarkable treasure discoveries in recent years. Discovered in 2010 in Frome, a tiny parish in Somerset, England, Dave Crisp discovered a pot full of coins buried in the clay. When he started, he brought up a measly 21 coins compared to what would eventually be unearthed, a collection of 52,503 Roman coins inside of a giant ceramic container. When he realized what he had found was much bigger than expected, he covered it back up and contacted archaeologists. Archaeologists owed a lot to Crisp's restraint because he ensured that they were able to excavate the find safely. Experts dated the coins back to between 253 and 293 AD, and the vast majority of them were bronze and silver. Given the weight of the entire affair, they extracted the coins in 12 steps. It's the biggest trove of coins ever found in Britain. Researchers also say that the pot must have been buried before the coins were inside of it, and then poured into it later. It would be far too heavy to handle with the coins inside of it. This suggests that whoever buried this didn't intend to get it back, and that it was some kind of ritualistic offering. No one knows for sure, but it's definitely an incredible and intriguing find. Hoxney Hoard In 1992, a humble English farmer misplaced a hammer and got his friend with a metal detector to go looking for it in the field. Eric Laws had received the metal detector as a retirement gift. You know this is going to be good. As he was scanning the ground, he got a strong signal. Laws started digging, and instead of the hammer, he found things far more impressive. 
a litany of precious coins and gold jewelry and silver spoons. Suspecting there might be a lot more, he contacted archaeological authorities and the police to report it. They came to the site and uncovered what has come to be known as the Hoxney Hoard, which contains the largest amount of 4th and 5th century Roman gold and silver ever discovered. There are upwards of 15,000 artifacts inside of the Hoxney Hoard, although most of them are coins. Besides jewelry and spoons, there are a couple of even rarer items, such as a body chain made from pure gold, and what has come to be known as the Empress Pepper Pot, which is essentially a fancy pepper grinder made out of silver and designed to look like a woman. The hoard is estimated to be worth somewhere around $4.6 million, but many of the artifacts inside of it are priceless on their own terms. Even though it's unclear who buried this or why, its discovery has helped researchers understand more about Roman life. Oh, and in case you were wondering, the hammer was also found! Most of this, including the hammer, are now part of the collection of the British Museum. Staffordshire Hoard Terry Herbert was just your average metal-detecting hobbyist, but he came across perhaps the most impressive hoard of treasure and precious artifacts ever discovered. While metal detecting around Hammerwich, Staffordshire, Herbert struck gold. Literally! Thinking that this was probably not your ordinary find, authorities came onto the scene and saw that Herbert had found a gigantic trove of Anglo-Saxon artifacts. For the most part, the Staffordshire hoard is made up of the various spoils of war. Most archaeological experts now think that the material within the hoard was procured from military conquests by the Kingdom of Mercia. Experts also agree that the hoard was probably buried for protection, but it's unclear why they never came back for the materials. All of the artifacts are related to war, and they're exceptionally well made. There are numerous gold swords and helmets left completely intact, as well as a giant cross that researchers think was brought into battle for religious protection. To understand the scale of this find, researchers rarely uncover gold sword pommels from the Anglo-Saxons, but the Staffordshire hoard had 50! There is so much gold in this hoard that it's hard to imagine how they were able to access so much of it! Dumbo Octopus The Dumbo Octopus is known as the world's cutest octopus. As part of the Grimpotufus family, they are famous for their large fins on their head that look like huge ears. They use them to propel through the water and steer their way through water currents, hence the name Dumbo Octopus, because it looks like they can fly. There are some 13 recognized species of Dumbo Octopus, and they vary widely in size, mostly around 8 inches, but one was spotted that was almost 6 feet long. These cuties with their large eyes look almost cuddly, but they are rarely seen because they live in very deep water, 9,800 to 13,000 feet, with some living as deep as 23,000 feet below sea level. They are known as the deepest living of all octopus species. They tend to live on tiny creatures that hang out on the ocean floor, and they live pretty relaxed lives. There aren't many predators to worry about, so unlike many other types of octopus, they don't even have an ink sac. When they spot prey, they will jump on it, swallowing it whole. We don't know that much more about them, so scientists are hoping to learn more as we explore deeper waters. The Babirusa Swine aficionados rejoice because the Babirusa is one of the most interesting and iconic pigs in the entire world. When you take a look at these pigs, you'll understand why so many people love them and are fascinated by them. They have a distinctive, almost prehistoric look, and their giant tusks extend out from the bottom of their mouths and curve up into the air. These tusks are overgrown upper canine teeth, which protrude downward from the snout and curve in an upward direction, sometimes even growing back into the animal's skull, cutting its skin. You can only find these animals on islands far removed from most of the world, which is why they evolved separately from other pigs that we see. They can be found in herds in the isolated forests on Indonesian islands like Sulawesi, where the most popular species of Babirusa lives, Togian and Sula. No one is quite sure why these swine have such large tusks. They only belong to males, and they don't seem to use them in fights. Maybe it's just a way to look attractive to the ladies. Flying Squid Of course, we've heard of the giant squid by now, but have you heard of the flying squid? It might sound like something straight out of science fiction, but there are some species of squid out there in the world which are actually capable of flying above the water. This just goes to show how much we have left to understand about Earth's oceans, as well as the animals that live under the sea. There were rumors for years, but in 2013, they were finally caught on camera. 
If we haven't been able to see a squid flying for this long, then what else might we be missing? Generally, these squid go from swimming and then jump into the air to start flying. As they're moving along, they'll open up to bring water inside and then blast it down to propel themselves into the air. Then they spread their bodies outward to act as wings. In fact, they are capable of arranging their tentacles in an aerodynamic fashion so as to create a gliding phenomenon that shares the same features as a good paper airplane. They'll often fly at around 25 miles per hour, and they're not doing so with wild abandon either. They maneuver their bodies in such a way that they can direct and change course mid-air. Scientists have seen over 20 of these squids gliding together at a time. They can glide up to 36.8 feet per second and remain in the air for about 3 seconds, covering 98 feet per flight. It's not clear why they do this, but scientists think maybe they are trying to escape predators, like flying fish do. Hopefully, we'll find out more about these squid in the future. Markhor The markhor might just be the most impressive and majestic goat on the planet. They're often referred to as the screw-horned goat because, well, their horns look like giant corkscrews attached to the top of their heads. Looking at some of the most impressive examples, you definitely think that this goat could unscrew a pretty big bottle of wine if given the opportunity. They can be found in Central Asia and the Western Himalayas. Given their royal demeanor, they've been declared as the national animal of Pakistan. Their name comes from the connection of two words in Persian, mar, which means snake, and kor, which means eater. So their name means snake eater. This is because legend would have it that markhors are seasoned snake killers and eaters. Once they've chewed them up, they allegedly release a foamy liquid saliva which dries on the ground. This is sought after as a kind of anti-venom for snake bites. They are also the biggest species of wild goats in the world, weighing up to 242.5 pounds. Females of the species will live in packs of up to 100 goats, and the males will occasionally join them for mating season. They are also well adapted to the mountainous terrain where they live. Have you ever seen one of these? Let me know in the comments below! Royal Flycatcher The royal flycatcher can oftentimes look like an average bird, but occasionally it lets its true colors shine. Hidden on top of its head is a hammerhead crest, which the royal flycatcher sometimes raises to reveal a beautiful display of colorful plumage. For example, this one releases its hammerhead crest to reveal the beautiful orange-colored feathers adorned with polka dots and bordered by white spikes. However, the royal flycatcher doesn't reveal these colors all that often. Instead, this rare bird usually appears as an unassuming shade of brown as it flies around the lowland forests of the Americas it calls home. You will tend to see them hanging out at the midline of the forest canopy, looking frantically for insects on which to feed. One other interesting feature of the royal flycatcher is the nature of their nests. They are around 3 feet long and pretty patched together. They tend to construct their nests on the edges of tree branches, and they'll often hang down into the streams over which they're built. Gooey Ducks With a name like Gooey Ducks, it has to be good. It's spelled like Geoduck, but it's pronounced Gooey Duck. When you first lay your eyes on the creatures, you might be confused. Is this some sort of sea snail or maybe a new instrument I haven't heard about? Actually, the Gooey Duck is a kind of giant clam that people say is one of the most delicious mollusks ever. I haven't personally tried one, have you? Just in case you were wondering, they are not related to ducks. They are not the biggest clams in the world. That title belongs to the appropriately named giant clam, but they are unique because their shell is only a small part of their bodies. Even though their shells only tend to be around 8 inches long, their bodies can grow to be over a yard long. They are what's known as a burrowing clam, which means that they dig holes into the sandy ocean floor and use their neck to filter water into their shells. Also, they burrow deep. If you're perusing the ocean floor, the only thing you'll see are the geoducts' two filtering holes peeking up from the ground, described as if you are looking into the barrel of a shotgun. The rest of them is way under. Chefs apparently love them. Have you ever seen one of these before? Or eaten one? Let me know in the comments below! Fossa The fossa is one of those rare animals that only lives in Madagascar, making it very unique and endangered. It's very closely related to the mongoose, but it's perhaps less well known than its popular cousin. But that should change because the fossa has a lot of intriguing characteristics that other animals don't have. Plus, it doesn't have a lot in common with the mongoose. At first glance, it looks more like a weird cat than anything else. The fossa is a dangerous creature in Madagascar. It's actually considered to be the biggest meat eater and most fearsome predator on the island. It'll go after whatever gets in its way. Even though it only weighs around 26 pounds max, it'll take on animals as big as wild pigs. It does so by using its claws and sharp teeth. 
However, they usually stick to taking down lemurs. Scientists know that fossas are smart creatures, and fast too. They use their slender frames to move around the forest with ease, their balance aided by their long tails, which can take up around half of their six-foot length. They make fun sounds too, making them seem even more like cats. They'll often purr when they're young. Darwin Bark Spider Darwin's bark spiders haven't been known to us for very long. Scientists only announced their discovery in 2009. But since they came onto the scene, they've shocked everyone who learns about them with their incredible features. For one thing, they're well known to produce the biggest orb web of any spider on the planet. It can get up to 4,340 square inches big. Can you imagine running into one of these? Yikes! Unsurprisingly, they discovered this spider in Madagascar, which is, as you know, a hub of unique biological activity. Most impressive, however, is the strength of the silk that Darwin's bark spiders produce. The silk that they make is 10 times more durable than Kevlar, which is the material that they use to make bulletproof vests. That makes it the strongest material naturally produced by a biological organism in the world. So they make the biggest and the strongest webs in the world. They're breaking all kinds of records. Their webs are so long that they often make them across rivers. It's unclear how they accomplish this Herculean feat. In order to research them, scientists often have to use boats because it's the only way to get near them and really see what they're up to. How do you think they get across the river? Let me know in the comments below. Dolores the Bear When you first feast your eyes upon Dolores, you might be unsure what to make of her. Is it a new breed of dog? Is it a sick coyote? Or maybe a giant rat? Well, I've got you covered. Dolores is actually a bear that doesn't have a hair on her body. Strangely enough, Dolores is a hairless bear that lives at the Leipzig Zoo. She is not a new species, but there's also a mysterious element to Dolores' predicament. No one can explain why she's hairless. Also, Dolores isn't the only hairless bear in Leipzig. All of the other female bears inside the zoo also lost their hair at roughly the same time. This has researchers scratching their heads for a satisfying answer. For reference, take a look at what these bears look like when they have all of their hair. A few bear researchers think that Dolores and her female friends might all be the victim of some as yet misunderstood genetic disorder, but there doesn't seem to be anything else wrong with them. These hairless bears have been very popular among zoo attendees, but they should probably give these bears some space so they can de-stress for a while. Stress is certainly a factor for hair loss. Axolotl Axolotls are adorable little water salamanders with a ton of interesting features. For one thing, they hold on to a lot of the characteristics they have when they're young. This is called neoteny, and it enables them to maintain their dorsal fin which many similar animals let go of at birth. They also keep their odd gills on the outside of their bodies, which have a feathery texture, yet another holdover from their younger years. So axolotls are pretty much in a state of arrested development for their entire lives. Given their unique nature, it should come as no surprise that they only live in a single lake complex in the wild called Cochimilco, which is near Mexico City, and they don't really like to leave. They are highly endangered, and most of the ones you see, or may even have as a pet, was most likely bred in captivity, or at least hopefully. Most members of this species opt to stay in the lakes forever, although some occasionally make it above the water. Their gills help them along the way, which sets them apart from most other salamanders. Perhaps most interesting of all, axolotls are capable of growing their limbs back at a moment's notice. That makes them a prime target of scientific research. Have you ever had one of these as a pet? Let me know in the comments! Let's hold out hope for these interesting creatures to make it into the future in the wild. Thanks for watching! What's your favorite animal from this video? Let me know in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to stay updated on all of our newest videos. See you soon! Bye!